Praise the Lord. I want, to, I want to minister today something that the Lord's put on my heart about praying the, 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 the need that uh, there is for the church to be serious and to get, I should say, get serious about praying for the leaders of our nation. And uh, I'm, before we're done, today or tonight, probably tonight, I'm going to give you three key reasons why most Christians, I won't say you, but most of you, <laughs> most Christians are not praying like they know they should for our leaders. I'm going to give you three very good reasons, and I'm also going to give you the answer to those, how to overcome those, those uh, hindrances to praying for our leaders. But, but before we do that, I want us to turn to Matthew 28 and establish some, some uh, fundamentals here. Matthew 28. This, of course, is the last chapter of the book of Matthew, and these words were uh, spoken by the Lord Jesus just before uh, He ascended into heaven. And uh, in verse number 18, this is Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came to His disciples and spoke to them. And this wasn't just... Twelve disciples, this was uh, uh, all of the disciples had, that had gathered. And says, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Now this word therefore is not just a connecting word. I'm, I'm, I'm going to refer to Greek every now and then. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I know how to read English. And I read books that are written in English about the Greek. Okay, so I'm not a Greek scholar. But this word that's trans translated therefore literally means so then or likewise or accordingly or consequently. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So then likewise, accordingly, Consequently, go. You go. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, based on that, consequently, you go and you make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What Jesus said, did when he said this is he transferred his authority. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, but then he went to heaven. He left us on earth, so he transferred his authority on the earth to us. He has authority in heaven. He doesn't have authority in the earth other than through his church. When God created Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve in His likeness. And He told them, He said, I want you to go and exercise dominion over the earth. He said, exercise dominion and subdue the earth. If you look that up in, in the book of Genesis, He said, I want you to subdue the earth. Have you ever stopped to think about what, what was it they had to subdue? He created everything, and it was all good. There wasn't anything out of order. But he said, I want you to have dominion, and I want you to subdue everything. Well, we do know the devil was there. Lucifer was there. Satan was there. He came through uh, the, the serpent. Now, the serpent was, was an, uh, you know, a physical creature, and the devil got into this physical creature. So there were some things there that God created that were right, but the devil was trying to destroy and trying to pervert. And God gave Adam and Eve the authority to have dominion over everything the devil would try to do. Well, we know what happened. They didn't use their authority. They listened to the... You know how you, know how you lose your authority in life? Is when you listen to the devil and then do what he says do. And, this, and this, this opportunity presents itself to us all the time. I, just this past week, I was in my study one morning, 
and I was meditating on some scriptures and I was praying and just spending my time with the Lord. And this thought of unbelief about something going on in my life came to me. This thought came to me. Well, you know, it's like this. And, and, I, and I thought about it for just a second. And I said, wait a minute. I said, devil, I didn't, that, didn't, that thought didn't come from me. That came from you. Yeah. That thought came from you. I rebuke it. I won't act on it. Now you take that thought and you get out of my life. Amen. We have to do that consistently right. in life. Because the enemy is always trying to talk. He's always trying to deceive. He's always trying to... to, to uh, ruin and thwart the plan of God for our life and he does it content and he starts with thoughts can even come into your mind just directly from the devil or from somebody else and we have to stand our ground and we do that because we have authority he transferred Jesus transferred his authority to us like I said God created man and gave man authority in the earth but when Adam and Eve sinned they forfeited that authority they really surrendered that authority to the devil. And the devil became, as the New Testament calls him, the God of this world. Not capital G, but little g. Amen. Satan became the God of this world and man lost that authority. But thank God Jesus came on the scene. Now when Jesus came on the scene, he demonstrated authority. He walked in divine authority. He ruled circumstances. He ruled the wind, the seas. He ruled the natural world. He, ruled, he did everything that Adam was supposed to have done. Adam and Eve were supposed to behave like Jesus behaved when he was here. He exercised authority. So we, have, we, had, we had man that lost authority. But then we had another man on the scene. He came through a virgin birth. And he came into the earth and we see one man exercising authority. He exercised authority over the natural world. He exercised authority over demons. He exercised authority over disease. He exercised authority over his, everybody that was trying to uh, uh, manage his life and take it in a different direction. He withstood everything victoriously until it was time for him to go to the cross. And then, then he surrendered himself. During the time he was here, there was this one man, he had authority. The authority that God originally intended for all of humanity to have. But interestingly, in, 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 and I'm, I'm, just, I'm not quoting all these scriptures today because I believe most of you know them. Jesus had 12 disciples. Well, I tell you what, let's, let's look at this because I want to I bring it out the right way. Look over in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And there are other passages in the New Testament that, that uh, recall some similar situations uh, as we're about to read here. It says in verse 1, Luke 9, 1, He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure disease. And He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now I want you to notice something. These men that he gave authority to over all demons and to heal the sick were not born again. They were still spiritually dead men. They were, they were technically still of their father, the devil. All unsaved people. That's, that's who their father is. They were technically under the devil's supervision, so to speak. But Jesus authorized them. Jesus gave them out of His authority. He said, I'm giving you a power and authority over all, I like that, that's underscored in my Bible, all demons. And He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And they went out, uh, verse 6 says, and, and they preached everywhere. Now, the 10th chapter, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two before His face. And it says in verse 17 that the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Your name. So He gave them authority to do what He gave 
the, the 12 disciples authority over. So now we have uh, 62 uh, disciples that have been authorized. And they're still spiritually dead men, but they've been authorized. That tells us that Jesus has the, has the ability to transfer His authority. And, and these, 70 said, these 70 said something very interesting. They said, the demons come out in your name. What Jesus did was He gave them the power of attorney to use His name. Now my wife has a, has a sister that's uh, older than she is. And uh, her sister is, is uh, not fully capable of taking care of herself. And my wife has been made power, she's been given power of attorney. Now power of attorney can be conferred limitedly and various. You can just have power of attorney conferred just over precise certain things. I think you've pretty much got everything. She's got power of attorney over all of her sister's affairs. So she handles all of her money, the money she inherited from, from her parents. She manages her sisters. She... she directs the investments. We keep an investment in, invested in an investment firm and it's earning a good rate of, of, of income. My wife takes care of all that for her. Uh, she has, she has the, the right to act financially and legally as if it was her sister doing it. She can enter into contracts. She can sign any, any legal paper and, and it's binding upon her sister even though her sister didn't sign it, she signed it because she has, she's been conferred power of attorney. Uh, she's also become my, her sister's health surrogate. So she can make decisions, you know, in concerning her health and, 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 and that sort of thing. When Jesus spoke to the disciples as he was leaving, and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I'm going to heaven. He didn't say that, but he demonstrated that. He went to heaven and before he left, he said, on the earth, I'm transferring the authority that I have on the earth to you. You go out with that authority and you reach the world with it. You use that authority, preach the gospel. He didn't, we don't have all of these words in Matthew's account, but in Mark's account, he said, lay hands on the sick, uh, 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 cast out devils. You take the full authority that's been given to me and you use it in this world to set people free, preach the gospel, and, and do what I would do if I was here. Now that authority belongs to the entire church. We see it belong to all of mankind. Then we saw all of mankind lose it. Then we see a man come. Jesus was God in the flesh, the Son of God, but He was also fully man. We see a man have that authority that God ordained from the beginning. We saw that man transfer that authority to His disciples. And then we see Him transferring that authority to the church. The reason this is important is because when God gave Adam authority, He made him responsible. Adam became responsible for what happened on this earth. And when Jesus walked in authority, He became responsible for the authority that was given to Him. When He was here in His, in his earthly ministry, He was responsible for what, uh, to, to do what the Father sent Him to do and exercise that authority. Well, the church has been given authority, and it's made, us, it's made us responsible. We are responsible. We're responsible for what we do with the authority we've been given. Now concerning the, the praying for our nation, over in, in, in uh, Proverbs, it says, I, I have this written down. I think it's the 29th chapter of Proverbs, somewhere in Proverbs, 29th chapter, I think. It says, when the righteous are in authority, how, how does that go? When the righteous in the, are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, man, they, men groan or they're, or they're in grief. Now, generally, 
uh, we've taken that to mean when the righteous are when the righteous flourish, and that word in the Hebrew can mean to flourish or to grow in number. But it's interesting that many translations translate it when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, they groan. Well, can you see that going on in, in our world today? Yes. That, the, that the world is groaning under the influence of the wicked who are in charge. Yes. When the wicked rule, it, it, it never turns out good. But when the righteous are in authority, well, that, that means we, when we take our authority. It doesn't happen automatically. You can read it like this. When the church takes its authority and walks in authority, then the people rejoice. That's why, and let's turn on over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, second chapter, where he says, he tells us to, to pray. He said, therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we might lead, now notice, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's what, that's what society is supposed to look like. Society is supposed to be a place of quiet and peace and rest and, and everything subdued, all of the evil subdued, and, and goodness to prevail. That's supposed to be the result of the, churches taking, the church taking its place in the world. When we take our place in this world, when we pray for our leaders and take authority, the authority that we've been given over uh, what the devil is trying to do, we can expect peace and, and tranquility and, and for uh, our lives to be conducted with dignity and reverence and not all, not chaos. Right. Right. We're living in a time where everything's just chaos. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems as though the world we're living in, it seems like people have just lost their minds. Yeah. Now, and it's, not, and it's not just, I, 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 I try to be aware of history. And I know that in, at, 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 at every time in human history, there have been, there, there, there has been times, there have been times of trouble throughout all of man's existence. All the nations of the world, there have been terrible times that, that people have gone through. The difference is we're living, we're living in a global culture now where every person, all of the nations are connected my wife and I, and, and I've been going to, to, to Africa for, for many years and doing mission work. My wife's gone with me. It doesn't matter where you go. I've been to South America. It doesn't matter where you go. People all over the world have the same technology. We go out and we do these crusades and, they've, and everybody's, everybody has their phone. Everybody has TVs and they're watching all of the same sports we're watching here when we watch, you know, the big soccer games. They're watching them all over the world. We have a global uh, culture now. And we're having ungodliness and insanity breaking out all over the world. Uh, the church isn't exercising its authority like it should. I, I'm going to just say that it's... It, the church is not exercising its authority the way it should. Now, I want to tell you a story. Uh, how many of you ever heard of Kenneth E. Hagin? Yeah. Anybody ever heard of Kenneth E. Hagin? Now, I believe Kenneth E. Kenneth e. Hagin was a, was a uh, very important man, a mighty man of God. Now, Brother Hagin didn't like to say he was a great man of God or a mighty man of God. He liked to say, I'm just an ordinary man with a great God. Brother Hagin was a very humble man, but he was a very powerful prophet and teacher. And uh, I believe in Kenneth Hagin. I don't believe on Kenneth Hagin. <laughs> I don't believe on him. I believe on Jesus. I believe on the, on the Lord. But I believe in the ministry that God gave Kenneth Hagin. Not too long ago, I was with a couple of pastors 
And, and we were talking about the significance that Kenneth Hagin's ministry has had on the church all over the world. How, he, we were talking about the different truths that, that Brother Hagin, by direct revelation from, from, from Jesus, the different truths that came f- by revelation from the Spirit of God that were all in line with the Word. Because every time the Lord would say something that Brother Hagin didn't see was in the Bible, he'd say, hold it. He'd say, now Jesus, if, if you can't show me this in the Word, I'm not going to receive it. I don't care if you are standing here telling me. He always made the Lord back everything up by the Word. And it always thrilled Jesus to do it. Jesus would just smile. He'd say, instead of giving you three examples, I'll give you four from the Scriptures. But we were talking, these, these pastors and I, these ministers and I, we were talking about how many doctrinal things Brother Hagin corrected in the body of Christ. How many, how many truths that, that he brought out that were so foggy and, and now they're well established in so many places. I remember when I was in Bible school in, at Rama, Dr. Ken Stewart was the, uh, was the dean. And, uh, and he had, a, he had a, a doctor of ministry degree from a university. And uh, he had studied theology and he taught us the different categories of theology. And, uh, and he said one of the most amazing things that he had learned from Kenneth Hagin was the, tr- was the teaching on spirit, soul, and body. He said, and, I've, and I've, got, I've got a library full of commentaries. I've read commentaries from different, you know, perspectives. And when people start writing, and you know this, Pastor, when they start writing and, and trying to describe the difference between the soul and the spirit, they just get all t- tied up in a knot. They'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, the spirit of man is such and such, and they'll uh, attribute certain characteristics of, of our nature to the spirit. And then they'll say, now the soul is this. And then in the next sentence, they got it all scrambled. It doesn't make any sense. One means the other, the other. And, and, and Ken Stewart said, Dr. Stewart said, Kenneth Hagin's writings were, were, were the first writings that I ever read that actually made sense, that actually clearly defined we are a spirit, we possess a soul, we live in a body. Amen. So that was just one of the, of the many truths that, that uh, Kenneth Hagin established. Now I said this because I, I want to tell you something that happened to Brother Hagin in 1970. Uh, and uh, he, he tells of this, of this experience uh, in, you can read about it in his book, The Art of Prayer. It was originally called The Art of Intercession. Then it got changed to The Art of Prayer. The Lord gave him some further uh, revelation on prayer, so he changed the name to The Art of Prayer. You can read this, this what I'm going to tell you in The Art of Prayer. You can also read about it in The Triumphant Church and maybe somewhere else. In 1970, in September, Dad and Mom Hagen had been, Dad Hagen had been invited to teach for the full gospel businessmen in Buffalo, New York. So they had driven to New York or flown to New York. And anyway, Dad Hagen had gone down, downstairs to get the supplies, their luggage and things, and bring them up to the room. And he was bringing up the last box of books to the room and into their hotel room. And it was a holiday inn. And he became sick. He said he became so sick, he said he, he felt like he, it would have been, he would have had to have uh, gotten better to die. I mean, he's just still deathly feel, uh, sick. And he walked in the, in the hotel room, Mom Hagen was there, and he put the, the, the last box of books down, and he said, I'm sick. And Aretha, he said Aretha had never heard him say, I'm sick. They'd been married over 35 years. She had never heard him say, I'm sick. Because he had just lived in, in divine health. Now the devil had attacked him a few times, but he'd always stand against it and go away. But this time he was, she had never heard him say, I'm sick. And it kind of startled her. And he, and he fell across the, he turned around and fell, he actually passed out. And he fell across the bed. And uh, now some of this detail I'm getting from uh, a publication called The Word of Faith, the Hagen's publication, in January of 1980. I was a Rhema student. I started in 79. I was a Rhema student. And so in January, The Word of Faith, he told about this, what had happened in 1970. I'd never heard about it. And as far as I know, he had never written or talked about what had happened in 1970. He talked about it in, in 1980. He wrote about it in The Word of Faith. 
And uh, when this happened, the Lord, he, he, he became ill because he had gotten out of the will of God. While he's laying there on the bed, the Lord said, uh, this has happened to you because you've not done what you were supposed to have done with the healing ministry. Brother Hagin said then that after this visitation, uh, actually the Lord just said this by the inward witness, but he went back and checked. He said he had not had a healing, an actual healing meeting. I think he had had two from 1965 to 1970. Two. And, and the Lord said, this has happened to you because you got out of my will where the healing ministry. You let the healing ministry go. So Brother Hagin's laying on his back. He said he had, before the Lord spoke to him, he did everything he'd always done before. He pushed every button, pulled every lever, confessed everything that he'd ever told anybody to confess, and he wasn't getting any better. So he said, now, Lord, I'm, I'm missing it here. Something's wrong, and it, and it can't be you, so where am I missing it? And that's when the Lord spoke to him. He said, I told you the anointing is in your hands, and you were supposed to lay your hands on people and tell them that the anointing's in, in your hands, and if they'll believe it, that anointing will go in them and heal their bodies. So the Lord said, if you're going to get healed today, you're going to have to lay your own hands on your body because the anointing's in your hands, like I told you. He said, you're not going to get healed if you don't do that. Brother Hagin said, it didn't take me long to get my hands on my body. <laughs> he said, as soon as he did, he felt that warmth, that glow just coming out of his hands into his body. And I've always thought, isn't that odd? He's laying his hands on his body, and the anointing is coming out of his hand into his into his body like it was somebody else. And he said within a few seconds he was 90% better and then the rest of it went away pretty quickly too. While he was having this, the Lord was talking to him, he saw something. He saw in the spirit, he saw three creatures, huge creatures that they looked like big black frogs. And in, in what he saw in the spirit... He said that they were as big as whales. They were huge. And they had come up out of the Atlantic Ocean and they were leapfrogging across the United States from east to the west. And the Lord said these three creatures represent three assignments of the enemy. Three things that the devil is trying to do to your country. One is to bring turmoil in the economic realm. One in the political realm and one in the uh, financial, uh, the uh, social realm, social uh, arena. He said the devil is going to try to cause chaos and confusion and upheaval in all three of these realms in the United States. It wasn't talking about the whole world, it's talking about the United States. He said, but you can stop it through prayer and taking authority over these things. He said, you can stop it. And this was in September of 1970. He said, now when you finish this meeting here that you're in with full gospel, he said, when you go back to Tulsa, he said, I want you to go back to Tulsa next month, that'd be October 1980. He said, I want you to conduct a seminar and I want you to teach on intercessory prayer, teach people how to pray, take authority over these things, how to pray for their leaders, how to pray for the nation. Well, he said in some of his writings that, uh, that I know he went back and he did do that. He did hold at least one seminar. But evident, and he did teach. But evidently he didn't do everything he was supposed to have done. Because in 1970, now that's 1970. Nine years went by. Oh, the patience of God. Nine years went by. And in July of 1979, uh, Dad Hagen for several years had been conducting camp meetings there in Tulsa at the, at the, at the uh, Tulsa Convention Center. And on Saturday night, the last night of camp meeting, so that would have been the last Saturday night of July, 1979, after the last service, all the speakers had gone up to, to pass. We didn't call him Pastor Hagen back then. We called him Ken Jr. It, we didn't mean any uh, disrespect. He's Pastor Hagen, excuse me, now. But back then he was known as, as, as Ken Jr. And so Dad Hagen said they all went up to Ken Jr.'s room, all of the speakers, to, for some refreshments. They were eating sandwiches and so forth. He said the Spirit of God kept moving on him. Prayer kept coming on him. So finally he told everybody, he said, you know, I, I, the Spirit of prayer keeps coming on me. And he said, I need to pray. Well, I want you all to join me. So everybody put their sandwiches down and everybody gathered around and they began to pray. They prayed in the Spirit. Now this is 1979. He said he got called up in the Spirit. He said he was just more conscious of, he didn't, he didn't even, he knew he was in that room. It wasn't like he was in a trance. 
but he was more conscious of spiritual things than he was of natural things. He said when it started, it started, this happened around midnight. And when this, what, what transpired in the spirit, when it was finished, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. So it had taken 44 hours. He said it felt like it was like 10 or 15 minutes. He ministered to each one of those speakers that were there by the Spirit. And then he saw these same creatures or similar creatures coming up out of the Atlantic Ocean again. One of them had come up. There were three of them. One of them was midair, hadn't landed on the United States soil yet. It was in midair. And the other two were still in the water, but they'd stuck their heads out of the water. And he saw this, and the Lord spoke to him and said, I showed you this very thing nine years ago. On on September, in September 1970, he said, I showed you these things, and you didn't do what I told you to do. Has anybody ever not done what the Lord told him to do before? It made me feel a little bit better. But he said, the Lord said, you didn't do what I told you to do. He said, if you had done what I told you to do, if you had taught the church and the church had prayed, he said, you would not have had the, this, the riots that you had from, from uh, 1970 to 1979, the, the uh, upheavals in the social arena, the economic trouble, and the political arena. He talked about the political arena in particular. He, and he was referring to Richard Nixon. Those of you who are old enough to know, or if you're a history buff, you know that Richard Nixon was, was uh, elected president in 1968, and then he was re-elected in 1972 by the largest landslide victory the, the nation had ever seen. Just overwhelming was re-elected. But we also know what happened in that second term. He was re-elected in 72. That next term started in January of 73. During 1973, the Watergate scandal started breaking because there was a break-in of the, of the Democratic National Convention headquarters in a, in a uh, uh, business or a, a, a building, a big building in Washington, D.C., and it was called the Watergate building. And they had broken in, and, and, and so there was a cover-up. By the, by the Nixon administration, people working for him, that apparently he knew about, which made him culpable. So all of this news is breaking in 73 and into 74. And you know what happened. Richard Nixon eventually had to resign from office. Jesus told Brother Hagin in this visitation that lasted four hours in 1979, he said, what happened to your president would not have happened if you had prayed. The church had prayed. He said, in fact, I'm holding the church responsible for what happened to the president. He said, when "When you tell this to the Christians, he said, uh, some of them will laugh at you. He said, but when they stand before me and the condemnation that should have gone to the man who was then president comes to them, he said, they won't be laughing them then. Well, that happened in in July, the last week of July in 1979. I didn't know anything about this. I'd never heard about it. Now, Brother Hagin published a book in the mid-70s. I think it was in 73, and it was entitled The The Interceding Christian. I'd gotten back into fellowship with the Lord at the end of 72, and I'd started reading Kenneth Hagin books in early 73, and I'm sure I had read that book sometime between 73 and 79. And so in that book, he had taught on the importance of praying for our leaders. But he didn't talk, this was in 73, he didn't talk about what happened in 1970. I didn't know about that until 1980. In the Word of Faith, January. Then the next month in February, I'm a student, Brother Hagin held a seminar on the campus. It was a a Bible, a, a prayer seminar. Out of that, the transcripts, transcripts from that February Bible seminar, prayer seminar, became the book, The Art of Intercession, which was, later became The Art of Prayer. That's where that book came from. So I read about this in January of 1980. When I read it, it so startled me because something similar to that happened to me in 1974. 
Now, I got back into fellowship with the Lord in 72, and I was a, I was a socialist. Thank you. <laughs> now I know what time it is. I got back in the Lord in, in uh, September of 1972. I was a socialist. I mean, I belonged to a socialist party. And I was a, a real warrior for the party. I would go out and knock on doors and get signatures. I'd go to rock concerts and stand out and raise money and, you know, for the cause, trying to get our man on the ballot. We, we ran a candidate, a socialist candidate uh, for president. We couldn't get him on the ballot in Florida, so I voted for McGovern in 72. Uh, we got him on the ballot in a few states uh, around the country, and, and, and nobody voted for him virtually. Uh, but I was a, a dyed-in-the-wool socialist. I believed in, in you know, cradle-to-grave care, free health care, free education, free everything. Our platform was as radical as anything going on today. Our platform that this, our candidate ran on was legalized, homosexuality, legalize all drugs, heroin, cocaine. Now, we've never heard of crack cocaine yet, I don't think. But all illegal drugs, legalize everything, legalize prostitution, legalize everything. That was our platform. It was a very radical, and I, and I, I, was, a, I was a card carrier. And uh, we hated Richard Nixon because he, you know, he was uh, overseeing, he was president, and the war was going on, the Vietnam War. And, and I went to war, anti-war protests. I was a drug dealer uh, during this time. And uh, we'd go to these anti-war protests, and, and Richard Nixon was just like the lowest thing you could think of. Honestly, I don't think we were as crazy in our hatred toward Richard Nixon as people are toward Donald Trump right now. There, there's, there's like an insanity going on there. But listen, my, my statements this morning are not political. I'm talking about what goes on in the spirit. In, that happened, I got back in the fellowship of the Lord in 72. Well, in 1974, Richard Nixon resigned. He announced under, under all of this uh, uh, investigation, it was clear that he was going to be uh, impeached by the House. He was going to be tried by the Senate, and, and he, would, he would actually be found guilty and would have been removed from office. So to save the nation that kind of grief, on the 8th of August, was it August? Yeah, August. On the 8th of August, he, uh, made a, he, he addressed the nation. I watched it on television. Everybody in America virtually watched it. For months this had been going on and it was, everything was in the news. He, had, he went on TV that night and he said that effective tomorrow morning, I will be resigning the office of president. See, and, and Gerald Ford became the president the next day. So the next day he, his, his resignation was going to be effective at noon. Well, that day, I worked for the telephone company, and I was putting in a telephone system in a department store. It was either a Sears or a Penny's or a Montgomery Ward. I don't because I put them in a lot of different buildings like this. I'm in this department store, and, you know, up on the second floor, if you go into a department store today, first floor is usually closed. Second floor, they have some clothes, but they have cookware and they have dinnerware kitchen stuff, bedding, so forth. That's what's on the second floor. On the second floor of this store, there was a, I think it was a layaway counter over one corner. You could go and buy things. You didn't want to pay for it right then. You could pay along. So there was a layaway counter along that, in one, on one side of the, of the second floor. You had to go behind that counter. The telephone equipment room was in behind a door behind that layaway desk or whatever it was, some type of a customer service desk. So I would come in and out of that door working on my equipment and I had gone to, uh, to uh, take my afternoon break and I went and got a soda and I walked down. Now back then you bought TVs at department stores on that second floor. If you older people remember, on the second floor where the mattresses were back over in the corner they'd have the, do you remember, any of you remember that? They'd have TVs set up on the, on, in, a, in a department store. We didn't call it electronics. It was just TVs. There were TVs, radios, and stereos. There weren't big TVs either. They, I mean, even big TVs were small. Lot, remember those console TVs? They'd have console TVs. They had some portables. Now, they did have black and white in 1974. They weren't very good, but they had them. 
And typically they had all of the stations, had all the TVs on and had all the stations on the same thing. So you could come by and you could look at the different TVs and compare the color and what you, you know. Well, this day, the ninth, when I walked out of the, out of the equipment room and got my soda, I had about 15 minutes, and I walked up and there was a crowd, not a huge crowd, but a, a gathering of people around in front of the TVs. And on the screen was the presidential helicopter, Marine One, sitting on the back lawn of the White House with the Marines standing there, waiting on the president. He had resigned and he had had a, 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 you know, a farewell statement that he had made to his staff and a lot of people were crying and so forth and that wasn't on, on camera. What was, it was all live, it was live. Every TV had the same, same scene. We're waiting for the president. He's already, transfer of power has already taken over. Gerald Ford's already been sworn in. They're, we're awaiting the president, the former president now, to, to come with, with uh, Lady, what was his wife's name? Pat. Board Air Force One, Air, Air, I mean uh, Marine One, one, and go wherever they were going. I don't know if they went from there to, to California or wherever they went. Uh, huh? Yeah, went to the airport to, to then to fly, catch a plane. So I walked out and... I didn't know anybody in this crowd. Jacksonville, this was in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida was a pretty conservative town. Most conservative people felt like Richard Nixon had been done wrong. That he, had bec he was used as a scapegoat. And that's the conversation that was going on. There were people who knew each other and there were people who were strangers and they were kind of talking to one another. And the, and the conversation went something like, ah, this is just a shame. This is terrible. I, I, this, this should have never happened to, to President Nixon. I, I don't think he did anything wrong. He's not done anything that, that the others, this kind of stuff goes on all the time. He's not done anything that nobody else has, you know, that no one's ever done. This is just, he's been railroaded. That was the kind of talk. I walked up, by, you know, behind these people. And I'm looking at this, but that's not what I was thinking. I got back into fellowship with the Lord, but my mind hadn't been renewed fully. I was word of faith. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke with tongues, had gifts of the Spirit operating in my life. I was reading Kenneth Hagin's material, and I still didn't like Richard Nixon. <laughs> I didn't hate him, but I didn't like him. And I remember in, inside me, inside me I was saying, I am so glad to see this day. That sorry rascal is finally getting what was coming to him. That's what I was thinking and saying in my heart. And I was very happy that the president had, had to resign in shame. And while I'm standing there and I'm thinking these thoughts, I heard Jesus, I mean, just as loud, you would think it was, there was somebody standing next to him. He said right up on the, on the inside of me, he said, yeah, and it's all your fault. You and the rest of the Christians because you never prayed for him. Now, when he said that, you, you know, when the Lord speaks to you like that, you don't argue. Some people say, I wish the Lord would talk to me. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> it's not always a good thing. You, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's no controversy. There's no arguing. I knew. Uh, then, and then 1 Timothy 1, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 came up, and I'm like, that's right. I never prayed for him. Not, all I've ever done was criticize the man. And instantly, I felt my lower eyelids just swell up with water and tears just flooded down my face. I mean, just spilled down my cheeks. And I'm standing there and I just, when Dad Hagen says that, that when this happened to him, when the Lord said, yeah, it's your fault, I'm holding you and the church responsible, Brother Hagen, it said, he said that he cried out and, and, began, and with tears began to weep and said, oh, oh God, oh my God. That's how I felt. I had to get out of there. Now, nobody, I had, everybody's back was to me. I turned and made my way across the store. I went in behind that, that desk. I was hoping nobody there would see me. I don't know if they looked my way or not. I'm just trying to get in that room. I got in that room and there were some boxes that had cable in them and about this high sitting off, off the ground. And I sat down on that box of cable and, and I just wept and just repented. I said, God, how could I be so, how could I be so hard hearted? How could I? And, I, and it was just ringing on the inside of me. This is your fault. You and the rest of the Christians. And I, had not, I didn't know anything about what had happened in 1970. I didn't know anything about the vision of the creatures. 
And I, in 1979, when the Lord said this to Brother Hagin, it hadn't happened yet. So I carried that on the inside of me. And, and, you know, for a while, I did just exactly what the Lord said. I began to pray for my leaders. But I didn't do it very long. I didn't stick with it. It wasn't too long before that experience just kind of fell by the wayside. And uh, it always bothered me that when the Lord spoke to me, He spoke so dismissively of Christians. And this, is, this was exactly what he said, and this was the tone. Yeah, and it's all your fault, you and the rest of the Christians. As if, you know, like, like bracket, the so-called Christians. That was the tone. And that always bothered me, Pastor. It bothered me because I, in my, in my mind I said, did that really happen? Did I really hear that? Because how would he speak of his church? So dismissively, he, he loves his church. It's his blood-bought church. He loves us. Why would he say the Christians like that? <laughs> then I read what happened in 79. This is a quote from Brother Hagin's from, from, his, from his book. It's what Jesus said. I'm going to hold the Christians. Notice he didn't say my church. He didn't say my lovely church. He said, I'm going to hold the Christians of this nation respons- responsible. You are the ones who allowed what happened to your nation. If you had prayed, it never would have happened. If you and, again, if you and the Christians had done what you should have done, none of those things would have happened to your nation. Again, when you tell that to some of the Christians, he, he, he passed over several opportunities to save my beloved church. He said, the Christians. When you tell that to some of the Christians, they will laugh. Well, uh, then I realized, Wow. I guess that was Jesus speaking to me. But you know, the thing is, I didn't do. I didn't do it very long. I, it, it fell away. I, I let it slip. And, and to be honest with you, I've been stirred up over the years at different times. And I've, got back, I've gotten back into the habit of praying for our leaders. And then I'd let it slip again. And I'd get my church all stirred up about praying for our leaders. And then we'd let it slip again. And it seems to me that I would always get stirred up around election times. That's when I'd get stirred up because things were getting bad and worse and couldn't get any worse. And this is the the most important election in our lifetime, church. You've got to get stirred up. And, And we'd pray and then we'd stop praying. Uh Three, three realms, I'm going to try to close here, three, three realms. The political realm, the financial realm, and the social realm. Riots, turmoil in the cultural realm, social realm, uh, upheaval in the financial realm, upheaval in the political realm. What do you think is going on today? You think there's some frogs involved? <laughs> Those creatures, now, now Jesus told Brother Hagin in 79, he said, you saw similar things in 1970 and you didn't do what I told you to do and I'm holding you and the church responsible, the Christians responsible. He said, but similar things are about to happen, not the same things. And those creatures, they're coming, they have the same assignment in the same areas. We can see that assignment working out in front of our eyes right now and it's been going on for decades. The political arena, we have a, you know what's going on in the political arena. We have a former president being tried for crimes. You can think whatever you want to think, whether he's guilty or not. I'm just saying, we've never had that before. That's what happens in banana republics. That's never supposed to have happened in America. That's what's going on right now. We're having uh, unrest and social... uh, demonstrations and writing and, and stuff. We thought we had put out anti, put away anti-Semitism at the end of World War II. And it's back and people are proud of it. People sitting in Congress are applauding it. Hatred. These same spirits are doing the same things. They're causing the same problems. Now, in 1970, 
1979, the Lord told Brother Hagin, he said, now these, these, these three creatures are trying the same things. And he said, something is going to happen to the president, it's 1979, that should not happen. And you can stop it through intercessory prayer. Now we know in 1980, when Ronald Reagan, uh, Ger Gerald Ford was president from, from 74 to 76, 76 to 80 was, was uh, Jimmy Carter. In November of, of 1980, Richard, I mean, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected. The next year, there was an attempt on his life, and he was spared. Brother Hagin later came back and said, we did that. Not just me, but the church. We got to praying, and we, and we avoided that. And so the president wasn't, wasn't killed. That didn't take that long. It didn't take that long for the church to get active. I'm telling you what, the church, we can, we can make up ground real quick if we get, if we get serious about it. We have to get serious about this. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I said that I'm going to give you three reasons why I have failed to pray at different times. And, and, I, and I would, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd put my wager that they're the same problems that have hindered you, the same things that have hindered you from praying. So we're going to talk about them tonight. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, why don't we stand? Praise the Lord.